This morning's message, by the way, is called Daddy God. Daddy God. We're going to be in Romans chapter 8 and Genesis chapter 22. It's just great to be with you all this morning. And I just, I heard something this week. It's, uh, I think it's funny anyways, but it's only funny if you're not super religious. But uh, there was an older gentleman, he was about 92, went to the doctor, he hadn't been feeling well, and uh, he went in to see the doctor, and the doctor told him what to do, and he, he went home, and a couple days later, the doctor decided to go to the city park for a walk, and he sees this older man, he's walking through the park, and he has a, a young girl in his arms, you know, real attractive, and he's walking through the park just real fast, and and the doctor thinks, boy, he must be feeling a lot better, you know. He doesn't look like he did the other day. And so he walks up to the old gentleman and says, hey, you know, how are you doing? He said, you must obviously be feeling a lot better. And he said, well, I did exactly what you said to do. He said, you told me to go find a hot mama and be cheerful. <laughs> and the doctor just paused real quick and he said, no, no, no. He said, I told you I have a heart murmur. Be careful. <laughs> Speaking of hot mamas, my wife isn't here today. <laughs> we miss her. She had to have her wisdom teeth removed yesterday. And she's doing really well, by the way. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, considering what's happened, you know, she's doing pretty good. She just didn't want to come to church with ice packs on her face and her cheeks swollen out great big. She figured she better stay home and just take care of herself today. But, you know, the thing with her not being here is... It's, we can handle that, but do you know really over time we have learned in a good way to rely on one another. And she came up with this saying a few years ago, Team Darnell. Because she just noticed that when I would not be able to keep up, she could step in. And when she couldn't keep up, I would step in. And that we always manage to compensate and be the strength where the other one's weak or to have time when the other one doesn't have time. Because how many of y'all know, uh, we do life together, she and I do. And we need that because how many of y'all know that life can be difficult? How many of y'all know that life can put us through tests and trials? Then maybe you're facing a test or a trial this morning. I imagine that you are. Some guy said, he said, you know what, if what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, by now I ought to be able to bench press a Buick. <laughs> Anybody relate to that? It's like, I knew that life was difficult, but I didn't know it was going to be quite this hard. And see, Sarah and I are having one another's back is a huge deal, but the thing that really brings us strength is that we both know who has our back. That we have a Heavenly Father, Daddy God, who has everything taken care of. And He's a very attentive Father. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 8.15. Romans 8.15. He says, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The word Abba is an Aramaic word that before Jesus, Jesus was the first person who ever used that word to describe God. Did you know that? And it's because nobody had related to God this way because the word Abba could be more closely translated as the word Papa or Daddy or listen to this affection. It literally means my dear Father. It's a relationship of love that Jesus had with the Father. And listen, Jesus changed everything. When the disciples asked Him, how should we pray? And he said, pray like this. And the first words that came out of his mouth were, Our Father who is in heaven. That we don't just pray to a distant God who doesn't care. We pray to a God who has adopted us through His Son into His family. Amen? And not only that, but now, not only are we His children, but that means we are part of a great family of brothers and sisters. The children of of God. It says He's not just my Father this morning. He is your Father as well. He's our Father, church. And we can cry out, my dear Father who is in heaven. 
He says, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How many of you are thankful that God lets His kids know you're mine? When somebody else puts you down, He says you're mine. When somebody else questions your salvation, the enemy questions your salvation. The Spirit of God rises up and says, no, you're mine. He says in verse 17, and if children, then heirs. How many of you all know that God has given us everything that's His? We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. There's one condition. If, if indeed we what? Suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. There's a reason this life is difficult. See, being a good father is one of the most important things I will ever do or could ever do. But there's only one perfect Father. And me, this summer, Sarah and I made a couple goals for our boys. We decided we wanted them to learn a couple things. Not to just goof off all summer, but we we wanted them to go to swimming lessons. We want them to learn how to swim. And the second thing is to get those training wheels off their bikes. You ever seen like a 10-year-old riding around, and if that's your kid, I don't mean to offend but get the training wheels off. See, our Heavenly Father knows that we will survive a bruised knee. And that's why He lets us go through trials. He doesn't want you to have to live your whole life with training wheels on. He wants to make you strong and capable. Amen? And so, guess what? At times, we're going to skin our knees. And with the tests of God, this is the good news. He never lets you fail. You just get to repeat it if you don't pass. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The thing that's a problem is I see some Christians on repeat their entire life. They're going through the same trials, the same struggles, the same thing over and over again. And God is wanting to equip you to learn to ride your bicycle. He's wanting you to learn how to swim without Him holding you in the water all the time. Are you you hearing me this morning, church? He wants you to grow up and become mature Christians. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't you think it's time you grow up? The pastor told you to say that. You can't get in as much trouble as you normally would. See, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. That means that everything that the Father has, it's ours. How many of you all know that God has perfect love? Then guess what? So do we. How many of you all know that God has a joy that's indescribable and full of glory? Guess what? So do we. How many of you all know that God has a peace that surpasses understanding? So do we. I'm going to preach somebody excited this morning. How many of you all know that our God is all-powerful? And He said, you shall receive power when My Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto Me. Anybody believe that we have the power of God in us? The same power that rose Christ from the grave dwells in His church. You have His joy. You have His love. You have His power. He has given you purpose for your life. And He wants to carry you into your destiny. And so He doesn't want your life to be in a continual repeat. He wants to equip you to pass tests. How many of you all want to go to the next level? Amen. How many of you all want to go through this test to the next level? Ready to kick the training wheels to the curb and go on with God? Well, there's something we're going to learn this morning from Abraham in Genesis 22. And the first thing we need to learn this morning is simply to trust Him. It's simply to trust Daddy God. Listen, if we fall, He's there to catch us. Did you know that? And pick us back up. Turn to Genesis 22. This account in the Old Testament may have more parallels with Christ and the cross and the gift of our Father of His Son than any other place in the entire Old Testament. It's just amazing. This alone, if an unbeliever were to read it with an open mind and realize all the parallels, they couldn't come to any other conclusion than that God had to have given it. Because listen, this is 1,900 years before the cross. And you are going to see parallel after parallel between the cross and what Abraham goes through here. Genesis 22 says, Now it came to pass after these things, notice this, that God tested Abraham. 
I believe that most of us are probably going through a test this morning. Anybody here, you can raise your hand. Anybody here facing a test in your life? We're not the first. And we're not even the first to face a difficult one. He tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. In verse 2 it says, Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, notice this, whom you love. He will test us in areas where we're tender. Do you know that this is the first time the word love is used in the Bible? It's to describe the love of a father for his son. Because it pictures, you know what Jesus said about, what the Father said about Jesus when he was baptized? Behold, this is my what? Beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. See, Abraham loved Isaac. Remember, Isaac was the promised son. Abraham, listen, waited 25 years for the promise of God to come to pass for Isaac to be born. And notice this. It says, he says, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. God is telling him to take the son he promised and go offer him on Mount Moriah. Are there things in your life that just don't make sense? Come on, church. I need an honest congregation this morning as well as awake. Are there things in your life that you are looking at God and saying, why? I want you to understand that that is part of the Christian life. Mystery in our life is necessary because it builds our faith. It builds our trust. And the interesting thing is that Isaac is the son that the father loves. Do you know where Mount Moriah is? It's the same mountain where Jerusalem is. It's the same mountain where the temple sets. It's the same mountain where Golgotha is, the place where Jesus Himself was crucified. 1,900 years before Jesus came, the Father has already given us the story of His love. Is this good church or what? See, our faith grows where there's mystery. None of this makes sense to Abraham. But looking back, it makes all the sense in the world. Because we can look at it now through the cross. But Abraham's looking forward to the cross. A lot of people think that the Old Testament people didn't know anything. But Jesus said of Abraham in John 8, He says, Abraham looked forward to my day and he rejoiced. It says in verse 3, you know what Abraham did? So Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Notice this. On what day was Jesus resurrected? Alright, look at verse 4. Then on the third day. Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder, notice this, and worship. And we will come back to you. Do you know this is also the first time that the word worship is mentioned in the Scripture. And it's not just a happy praise song. It's a sacrifice of life. You know what the Bible says in Romans 12, 1? It says, Therefore I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And another way to translate that would be, which is your reasonable act of worship. See, it's one thing to sing songs. It's another thing when my life is a song. And the way I live and the way I treat people and the way I respect God and live for Him is a song that brings Him glory. That brings tears to my Father's eyes. Abraham went on the mountain to sacrifice and to show God, you come first, I trust you. And it says, notice this, and we will come back to you. <laughs> is anybody else awake? <laughs> The Bible's better than you thought it was even. This book is really good if you haven't noticed. 
The Bible says in, in Hebrews 11 that Abraham took Isaac up there and what Abraham knew is this, that if he were to have to sacrifice him, that God was able to bring him back from the dead. The crazy thing is that no one had been raised back from the dead at that point. But he had that kind of faith and I believe that God had already showed him the way of salvation. We will come back to you after we worship. Verse 6 says, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son. Notice he takes the wood and he puts it on his son's back to carry up the mountain. Who 1900 years later had a cross tied to his back and was forced to carry it up Mount Moriah? It says, Then he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. Church, trust is the foundation of any relationship. See, God had already had Abraham go through prior tests. He asked him, He said, Abraham, I want you to leave your father's house, your father's home. I want you to go to the land of Canaan. Didn't make any sense, but you know what Abraham said? Okay, God, I'll do it. He shows up. He brings his nephew Lot with him. Lot picks the land of Sodom and Gomorrah to live in. The kings of the east come and attack. They take Lot and his whole family captive. Listen, professional armies. And Abraham goes with his servants and shepherds and defeats the armies of four trained kings and brings back Lot, his family, and everything. God is faithful. He's learning to trust God. He gets back and the wicked king of Sodom says, you know what, I'll pay you for doing that. And Abraham says, no, I don't think so, lest you say you're the one who made me rich. Only God provides for me. You can keep your money. At 75 years of age, he's promised a son. And it took 25 years when he's well past the age of bringing children into the world. At the age of 100, when his wife Sarah is 90, his son is born into the world. God had learned, Abraham had learned that God is faithful. Sometimes we just need to take a history lesson in our own life, don't we? We need to go back and remember all the things and all the trials that He's brought us through. Trust God. He brought you through the last trial, the last test. He's not going to drop you off this time. You say, but this one's harder. I know, because He's taking you to a higher level. Did you all just hear that? Abraham, over time, had learned to trust God because he had learned, to, number two, to know Him. There's a difference between knowing about God and knowing Him personally. Jesus said, and this is eternal life, that they may know Him, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom He has sent. John 17, 3. It's about a relationship. And Abraham has formed this. Is this good, church? Genesis 22:7. I guess if nothing else, I'm enjoying it. Verse 7 says, But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself. And I like the old King James that says, God will provide himself. <laughs> Because he did. He will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Church, at some point you're going to have to get excited whether you wanted to or not. (laughs) Where's the lamb? God will provide the lamb. And the lamb will be himself. So the two of them went together. And in verse 9, they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. Notice this. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. How many of you know that Jesus carried the cross, the wood, up Mount Moriah? And when he got there, he was laid and nailed upon that wood. And now Isaac is fastened to the wood that he had to carry up the mountain. And it says in verse 10, And Abraham stretched out his hand, Imagine this over your son that you love. 
He stretched out His hand and took the knife to slay His Son. The interesting thing is when you read the next chapter, you find out that Sarah, 37 years had passed since Isaac was born in the next chapter. A lot of people think that Isaac was just a boy here, but he wasn't. He was a young man, probably in his 30s. How old was Jesus when He died for us? It's very likely that there's a 33-year-old young man laying underneath the knife of his father right here. The son of promise. Our greatest worship is sacrifice, church. It comes when we know Him, when we love Him. See, it comes when this when we face situations that we just wish they would go away. We expected them to already go away. And nothing has changed. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you face difficulties that just don't seem to just lift. Your prayer was, God, take it. And instead, He's given you strength to endure it. Anybody with me this morning, church? That only comes when you know Him. And you look back and say, God has been faithful thus far. He will carry me through this as well. Tis grace that has brought me safe thus far, and grace will bring me home. Praise God. I know no matter what happens, God is good. Amen. Trials in life don't change the character and the nature of God Almighty. He remains a good, good Father no matter what. No matter how many times we skin our knees. No matter how many times we fall. No matter what difficulties we face. We are coming to His throne one day and He is going to show us that He is good. Ultimately, coming through a trial is based upon this, that we trust Him because we know Him. And we know Him, number three, because we've learned to love Him. We've learned to love Him. Abraham didn't go on that mountain just to go through the motions. He went on the mountain to worship God. He went on the mountain to worship. It says in verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham! As the knife is in the air, the, Ab the angel begins to scream at him, Abraham, Abraham! And so he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your what? From me. The only difference between this account and what happened 1,900 years later is 1,900 years later, the father had to let the knife fall on the only son of his love. Because he loved us too. And he wanted to make us his sons and daughters, heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. There's no question of His goodness, is there? Anytime I start to wonder, I just need to look back at the cross. And all of my life comes back into perspective. God, I don't understand, but I know I can trust You. I love You, Lord, because You first loved me. And you see His love here isn't just in word. It's in what He does. Jesus said, if you love me, in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I want to say to the church, don't just come to church. Don't just do good. Listen, obey Him. Amen. Ultimately, that is the thing. That is God, Father God's number one love language. It's action, isn't it? From the heart. Action from the heart. I don't mean dead works. And it's not to earn His love. He already loves you. There's nothing you can do to change that. It's for you to express your love to Him. Is everybody with me? It says in verse 13, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behind him was what? 
a ram caught in the thickets by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Do you remember earlier Abraham said God will provide for himself a lamb? I want you to notice something. Here isn't where the lamb was provided. Here's where he gave him a ram. Because the lamb of God was yet to come. 1900 years later, the lamb of God hung on the cross for our sins. Church, this is better than you are acting. I thought the sign said Cornerstone Community Church when I pulled in this morning. I think the word was God shows up and it is in a graveyard. Verse 14 says, And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. As it is said this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. God provided the perfect sacrifice for our sins. His name is Jesus. God sent the Son of His love, let Him live a sinless life so He would be the spotless Lamb whom the wood would be laid upon His back that He would have to carry beaten and bloody up a mountain where He would be nailed and hung to a cross where He would look over His accusers as they scorned Him and yelled at Him and they'd plucked out His beard and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And there He would let out a shout, Father, unto You I commit My Spirit and He breathed His last. Because it was finished! Three days later, the stone is rolled away because the Son of God is victorious. The Lamb of God has taken away the sin of the world. His name is Jesus. He's worthy of my trust. He's worthy of our love. That's His name. God, no matter what you're facing, there's one fact that remains. No matter how big, how tough your trial is, our God is bigger. Romans 8.31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? No one and no thing can stand up against Him. Verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. Us all. Not just me, but for you. For your neighbor, for this world. Shall He not with Him also freely, what? Give us all things. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. And He goes on to say in verse 37, after He speaks of the trials that we will face, He says, yet in all these things, in all of our trials, in all the temptations we face, we are more than conquerors, church, through Him that loved us. I want to put up a picture this morning of a father and son. It's not the clearest through the projector. Some of you have seen these fellows before, but most of you probably haven't. This is a father and son, uh, Eugene and Rick Hoyt. And the son, Rick, was born with his umbilical cord wrapped around his neck. He didn't get enough oxygen at birth and he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. The doctors told him, told the parents, your son's just a vegetable, just let him go. But they said, no, we're going to fight for our son. And they took care of little Rick and and began to raise him. And, And listen, he couldn't speak. He had no voice. And they began to design computer programs to try to Literally read mind. Read the mind. Read the waves in the mind. And they hooked him up to this machine and after a while it started to work. And, and, and Rick started to be able to speak through a computer. And, and he began to, be able to communicate. And the thing they found out is though he couldn't speak, he couldn't walk, he couldn't do anything physically, he was really bright. Extremely intelligent. And, and so much that eventually he even went on to college and he has earned several degrees. But something happened when he was in high school. He went to high school in a wheelchair with his computer hooked up to him and he began to learn. 
and there was a lacrosse player at the school that had gotten injured and was now paralyzed. And they were going to have a benefit run for him, a 5K race. And Rick looked at his dad, Eugene, and he said, you know what, Dad? I'd like for us to run in the race to help him out. And his father, he had been in the military, but he was in his later 30s now, had really gotten out of shape and hadn't run or done anything physical in years. But he looked at his boy and thought, well, I've got to say yes. And so his dad's really out of shape, and he puts his boy in the wheelchair, and they go up to the, and, and they run the race. And it was really hard on him because he was completely out of shape. And I doubt he would have ever done it again. But when the race was over, uh, Eugene looked at his dad, or Rick looked at his dad and said, Dad, when I'm running, I feel like I'm not handicapped. Since that day, it's been a lot of years now, over 40 years, they have run over 1,300 different races. Listen to this. This is this boggles my mind. 72 marathons. Marathon, 26.2 miles pushing someone, mind you. How many of you on a dad must have gotten in really good shape? Seven triathlons. That's not only where you run, it's where you also bike. So he designed a bike to put his son on the front and swimming. He would literally have to swim like a couple miles with his boy tied on behind him in a boat. Pulling him through the water. That's the love of our Father. Yeah. Ultimately, they even walked a few years ago back and forth across America. It was 3,735 miles. They did it in 45 days. I hadn't seen... Lincoln for about a day and a half because we let him go stay with his grandparents and Sarah was having the surgery. And he comes into my office and I'm dying to hold him, you know. And I pick him up and he says, Daddy, when you hold me, I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> I don't know if you get bigger than God, but I do know this. When your Heavenly Father picks you up, you become as big as He is. His peace becomes yours. You become as powerful and strong as He is as He holds you in His arms. Probably the most inspirational Bible verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I want to invite our worship teams forward this morning. The Lord is about ready to bring transformation in this church. A lot of us have heard the before story about our trials. But how many of y'all know that God is the master of taking your test and making it become your testimony? He is about ready to burst on the scene in this church and there's going to be a lot of before and after stories. This is what happened in my life. This is what I've been going through. And this is what God has done. Are you hearing me this morning, church? Because Daddy picked me up. And when Daddy held me, I became as big as He is. And Daddy's bigger than anybody. Hallelujah! Turn your test into a testimony this morning, church. These altars are open. And Daddy God's standing there. And He's waiting for His kids to just come with their arms raised. Daddy, I need you to pick me up. I'm hurting. I'm struggling. I need your strength. I need your peace. I need your love. I need your joy. And by the way, dads, if you're here this morning, we have something for you, so please don't leave yet. But these altars are open this morning for anybody who wants to see in your life your test become your testimony. Hallelujah. God is transforming His church this morning. He is bringing us through our trials. You may be going through a storm, but remember the word through means you're not staying there, but you're graduating from it. 
This storm came and the storm went. But God made me stronger and brought me through it. Church, these altars are open. Let us stand and worship. Let us be like Abraham and give Him our life. This morning, God has shown us all we need to do is trust Him, to know Him, to love Him. And our life is our worship. Turn your test into your testimony. Let's see what God does. I'm excited to see how God is going to bring breakthrough in your lives as this Word takes root in our hearts. Heavenly Father God, we thank You for Your Word. It's better than we even realized. Only You could give a book that's infallible in all its teachings. And we thank You for Your Word, Father God. We thank You for the gift of Your Son. And we pray right now in Jesus' name that no matter what mountain we're facing, no matter what trial we're going through, we just want to run to You, Daddy God, right now and just jump into Your arms and let You carry us through this storm, through this trial, and to make us stronger because of it. Hallelujah. Father God, I pray for Your presence to just be manifest in this house now. Lord God, we've enjoyed Your presence thus far, but we pray for an outpouring of Your glory in this place because You haven't given us a spirit of fear, Lord. But Father God, You've given us a spirit of adoption whereby we cry out, Abba Father, Daddy God, our dear Father, we worship You today in Jesus' name. Amen.